Hi, I'm Tim Lee, the founder and executive director of One Black Man Incorporated, and you're watching Empowering Voices. Within the context of celebrating African American History Month during the month of February, Empowering Voices is intentionally holding conversations with theologians about their work in black theology, if you will, based on the ministries or teaching perspectives that they're working in. And in this particular podcast series today, we are in conversation with Tim Lee, the founder and executive director of One Black Man, Inc. Welcome to Empowering Voices. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. If you would, starting out in our conversation, speak to the political naysayers who find it difficult to embrace particularity when it comes to people of color in a post-racial, what they say is a post-racial and or multicultural society. Why would one name an organization One Black Man Incorporated? Well, I, I really don't believe in um, some of these people and what they're saying. I don't believe that this is post-racial. I do not believe that um, everybody is the same and everybody's equal. I think that there are some distinct differences between blacks and whites that we have to address. And One Black Man uh, Incorporated is a title because I think I wanted to bring out the power in one and that one person can make a difference. One person can change the world. And I think along the lines of the 1960s, that black power movement, when each one reach one, each one teach one, then that person becomes a person who is empowered as one to, each, to teach one and to reach another. So one immediately becomes 10, and 10 becomes 100, and 100 becomes 1,000. And so I chose um, one black man because I wanted to bring uh, some attention to the power of one again. And I wanted to keep it as, um, I, wanted to, I, I wanted to keep it, the attention on bl blackness and black manhood. Um, you know, when I look at how, um, you know, the black man is being attacked and the ways that uh, we're being attacked in the media, we're being attacked uh, educationally, uh, uh, medically, or health-wise. We need some attention ourselves, and there are majority people or white people who particularly focus on black boys, black girls, black people, and they make their money. But when black people do it, it's a problem. And so I think that if, our, if the problem is ours, then we have to be instrumental in being a part of the solution. If you would tease that out more when you say that white people make money on black girls, black boys, what, what are you referring to? In other words, I think there is a farce about this equality thing. Uh, I think everyone, like I said, knows that everyone is different. Um, but what happens is the, the, the white standard is exalted after everybody has accepted the, this farce of equality. And so the white standard is exalted as the standard and then everybody then has to reach toward it. Then sometime along the way, um, they say, oh, well, you know, black women have different hair than white women. They need another shampoo. So we're gonna have head and shoulders for colored women. You see what I'm saying? Then everyone, because deep within themselves, they knew that they were different anyway, they go out and buy the stuff that, right? Hallmark did the same thing with mahogany and the lines. You know, there are concentrations and focus on blackness, brownness, and other uh, cultures but when white people control it, they get the, the money. But when we control it, we get um, a, a pointed finger and a shame on you. You shouldn't be doing that because we're in the post-racial, right? And Obama's in the White House. I don't, I don't buy it. Now, you are integrating your theology within the context of you're a Christian, you're a minister, you're a believer of Jesus the Christ, the liberator. Speak to one black man, Inc., Jesus the Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that Jesus was one black man. Maybe he was the original one black man. Uh, I, I am a professor and believer in um, Jesus being black. And that's another kind of um, thing that we sort of struggle with in society where uh, we have to say black Jesus. But when you say Jesus, it's just understood that you see what I'm saying, he's white and we're always the one who has to put the adjective in front of it, to whatever. At any rate, so we know that Jesus hid 
in Egypt and he would not be able to hide among people of color if he were pale with blonde hair and blue eyes and all those things like that. So Jesus was a man who had a serious connection with God. He knew his power, he knew his ability, and he healed people. He made people well. He didn't do it to get money. He didn't do it to get fortune and fame. He did it because it needed to be done. And I think that this is the kind of mentality that we have to instill in the younger generations. This is the kind of ideas or idealism that we have to have in this generation. Society was not really um, as different then as it is now. People were sick, they were incurable diseases, all those things like that. Um, and we need some more people who would be like Jesus to liberate, to heal, deliver, and to do it in a way that is going to be uh, empowering in a sense, uh, I think just as Jesus did. How do you integrate the teachings of Jesus to young black boys, if you will, young, young black men. And let's just look at a statistic that was revealed, I believe, uh, perhaps two years ago by the University of Chicago that they were estimating that every single day for African American and Latino youth, between male youth, between the ages of 10 to 24, either they were being shot at and or killed. How do you speak to a young boy, young man, young adult man who's living in a societal context like that and talk to them about Jesus and, and, and empowerment within the context of One Black Man Inc. Well, first is uh, that I, I, I am very clear in saying that One Black Man Incorporated is not a religious organization. I think that parents who have children in church can find confidence that I'm a, a minister. Um, but I think that generally, and I hope I don't get in trouble, <laughs> but I think that generally Jesus is used too much. And a lot of people think that they know what you're gonna say when you start talking about Jesus, especially because of the presentation as it has been in the years past. Uh, I think uh, Malcolm X and the, you know, the Nation of Islam, they've said that the, you know, Jesus is a white man's religion. And I think that resonates, whether subconsciously or consciously, with a lot of African-American men. Uh, and so using that um, might bring more I think I know what you're gonna say, so I'm not gonna listen. You know? So what I try to do is I try to focus on the historical, psychological, sociological, and all those things like that, and bringing a different perspective from what they think they may already know. And so when it comes to violence and black-on-black -black violence, uh, um, you know, especially, you have to not just look at the symptoms, which is, which is what it is. You know, I'm black, you're black, we're killing each other. But there is a cause to this effect. And to bring out this cause that we are living in a very criminal society, a society that is violently um, and disrespectfully um, going against um, African-American males um, financially. I mean, there are a lot of factors that play into the reason why African Americans or black men are acting the way they're acting. You know, there's an emasculation in a sense, right? So let me try to bring myself together and not be scattered. Um, using this as an example of, of history, after a black man was hanged, his body parts were cut off, right? His ears, his nose, and even his penis, right? That's emasculation. As it was in those days physically, it has transformed and is still now where the man is a provider, the man is someone who um, is a protector. And when you take away his ability to protect and to provide, there's a degree of emasculation. And when a man is emasculated, he does not act like a man. You see what I'm saying? And so we start talking about those things and not just me teaching per se, but bringing things into uh, an engaging kind of conversation where they can come up with these ideas on their own, which I think distinguishes one black man from other organizations who do some of the same thing. Can you share a success story of how a life has been transformed? Well, um, you know, I, I think that there has not been one workshop that we've done where there have not been people who are saying, you know, can I, do you have a book? Or, you know, I am thirsty for new knowledge. I, I want to read now, I want to learn now. And that has inspired me to let me know that African-American males are not lost. Uh, even though there's a degree of aimlessness on, on the surface where we're um, chasing after women or chasing after music, chasing after a good time and entertainment and all this stuff as um, culture, American and black culture has now sort of become. When, we, when, when people find out about information and get a, a sense of something that they have not heard about before, there is a thirst 
and excitement and the high or natural high that knowledge sort of gives and that brings me a great deal of comfort. And how can one get in contact with you to perhaps offer seminars at their locations or find out more about who is One Black Man Inc. and how your foundation is servicing young uh, people, young males and adult males of African American descent? Well, we have a website, www.oneblackman.org, O-R-G, and it's one O-N-E, not the number. So again, that's www.oneblackman.org. Uh, that's our website, um, and I think that's the, probably the best way. There's a contact page on those things uh, on the website and other places. Great. As we move towards the conclusion of our podcast uh, series, would you please speak to, first and foremost, um, our podcast series is intentionally titled Empowering Voices, Uplifting the Voice of the Voiceless. Would you speak within the context of One Black Man Incorporated? What is empowerment? Is that a critical cause or impetus, if you will, for the One Black Man Incorporated Foundation? Well, yes, definitely. Uh, empowerment is, 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 is a really serious uh, word that I love. <laughs> and I think I may use it too much. But, um, you know, when we talk about empowering the voices of the voiceless, I think that the young generation is a generation that is easily dismissed, pushed to the side, marginalized, ignored, and all those things like that. And if we really believe that youth are the future, and, and that the youth who will be most successful in the future are those who are prepared for it today, then we will do everything we can and in our power to um, uh, give them power in the present so they will be more prepared in the future. And I think that um, in the context of one black man, uh, as it relates even to empowerment generally and black power, um, you know, I, I'm just, I just remember the, uh, um, the visual of you know, a, a, a man who's laying on the ground, right, with someone who has their foot on their neck and they cannot get up, right? Um, you know, let's just, let's just use historic, this is Black History Month, historically speaking, there has been a white man's foot, right, on the black man and the black woman's neck. You cannot get up, you cannot move. Do you sit in, in your laying down position and saying, oh, you know, God help me get this man's, foot off my neck, right? Do you stand up and do you ask the man, sir, will you please, you see what I'm saying, get your foot off of my neck? Or do you have faith enough in yourself, power and confidence in yourself, believing that you don't deserve to be laying down with someone else's foot and say, I'm going to get up. And when I get up, that foot is going to have to, right? And I think that we're in a position now where we have to tell our people, you must get up, right? and get up by whatever means is necessary. Whatever means, I mean, that may sound a little um, re revolutionary, but I think that it's, it's time out for asking, time out, right? It's in empowering oneself, believing in oneself, and getting into the position that we were created and designed to be in.